Welcome to AP Psychology Unit 1. This video covers every single part of the biological basis of behavior in psychology, meaning it has a lot of terms to memorize and it's worth a fair amount on your AP exam. This video is simply all of my AP Psychology Unit 1 topic review videos clipped together into one big video, without the AP style questions at the end of each video. If you want to try some AP style questions associated with each topic of Unit 1, my full AP Psychology Unit 1 playlist will be in the description. As this content is all free to you, all I ask is you please follow my Instagram, but anyway, Anyway, let's get into Unit 1. So let's start with a basic definition of psychology. The study of the mind and behavior. Essentially, psychology tries to answer one question. What causes our brain to act a certain way? If you were wondering, there's infinite answers to this question, and a lot of answers that haven't even been found out yet. Essentially, the answer to this question boils down to two things. Nature versus nurture. Nature refers to the genetic and biological traits you are born with. Things like DNA, brain chemistry, and inherited tendencies that influence one's physical, behavioral, and mental traits and processes. Nurture, or environmental factors, refers to all the external factors that one experiences throughout life, such as their education, culture, or their family. So the question here is which one of these has a big effect on someone's personality, behavior, or mental state? The answer is, I don't know. There are many different approaches to psychology that all have their own answer to this question. For example, if we look at the evolutionary perspective championed by Charles Darwin, it explores natural selection's effect on someone's behavior or mental processes. Of course, natural selection is the evolutionary principle that animals and organisms that are more adapted to their environment are more likely to survive and pass on the genes that aided their successes to future generations. The issue here is when you start applying natural selection to society and it turns from Darwinism to social Darwinism. This is where it becomes easy to discriminate against others that have more quote-unquote less favorable characteristics. Eugenics is a prime example of this. This is an ideology that's primary purpose is to only make the people that have the most quote-unquote desirable characteristics have sex so that their kids would have the most desirable characteristics and improve the human race. And in case you're wondering, this was used as a justification in World War II by the Nazis to discriminate against Jews, and in the future, eugenics as a whole was discredited as unscientific. So we just saw an example of how an approach of psychology views nature versus nurture. But before I go, I have to credit probably the best studies on the nature side of things. That of course is twin studies, such as the Minnesota twin study, that found that identical twins that are raised in two separate environments still show significant similarities in personality and intelligence. This supports the role of genetic influences on behavioral and mental processes. This question is one that has many answers. Hopefully by the end of this course, you will have your own answers for it. However, for now, all right, we have a nice and easy one today, the nervous system. If you're wondering what the nervous system is, its primary purpose is to receive messages, which could be anything as simple as what your hands touch or your blood pressure. Then it figures out what the message means through interpretation and sends out the right instructions to anywhere in the body like organs or muscles, all with the primary purpose of keeping your body balanced or in homeostasis. So here's where we introduce the two parts of the nervous system, the central and the peripheral nervous system. Your central nervous system will easily be the most important in this course. It houses the brain and the spinal cord. Its job is to interpret all the information that comes in and send out orders to the body. Think of it as your control center. Once the message is sent from your central nervous system, it goes into the peripheral nervous system. The peripheral nervous system acts as your messenger system. It carries info in and out of your central nervous system. The peripheral nervous system, however, includes two very important systems, the somatic and the autonomic nervous system. The somatic controls voluntary movements of muscles, stuff as simple as typing, walking, or even picking something up. The autonomic controls autonomic functions, which are functions you don't really think about. Things like your breathing, heartbeat, or maybe your digestion. And the autonomic nervous system has two systems in it as well, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic will prepare your body for action, stress, or emergencies. Think of it as your fight or flight response. The parasympathetic will calm your body down afterwards. So imagine if you stubbed your toe. Sensory neurons in your somatic nervous system send a pain signal through the peripheral nervous system to your central nervous system, which processes the information and sends motor signals back through the somatic system to move your body, all while your autonomic nervous system responds involuntarily, and later the parasympathetic nervous system will calm your body and restore homeostasis. Wow, that was a lot. Let's Our brain has a lot of cells. The two most common are neurons, which transmit information, and glial cells, which provide help with structure, insulation, communication, and waste transport. The nervous system works through electrical and chemical pulses that transmit information and responses. One such example of this is the reflex arc, which is a dedicated neural pathway that controls your reflex movements, such as when you immediately take your hand off the stove when it is hot. 
The arc is made up of sensory, motor, and inner neurons in the spinal cord. Let's focus on just an individual neuron. The way things are communicated is by a chain of neurons. For a signal to be fired, an action potential must be reached. To dumb it down, essentially there are a bunch of positive ions waiting to enter a polarized neuron. This is a neuron in resting potential. When an outside stimulus occurs, the positive ions go in the neuron, which is a process called depolarization, until they reach a certain threshold. Once the threshold is crossed, the action potential fires completely and at its full strength, regardless of how much the threshold was exceeded. This causes a short time where another action potential can't happen, known as the refractory period. When an action potential is fired, it creates a signal going down into a chain of neurons. Here is what one neuron looks like. Dendrites receive signals from previous neurons. The soma houses the nucleus of the cell. Then the signal goes into the axon, which is insulated by myelin sheath, with the gaps in between the sheath called nodes of Rainvier, where it gets transported into the axon terminal to get sent out into the synaptic cleft, and caught by the dendrites of another neuron and goes on and on until it reaches where it needs to be. You might be wondering what the signal does. Simply put, it releases a neurotransmitter. Different neurotransmitters are sent based on the situation. Let's go through them as quickly as we can. Dopamine is for when there is a reward, motivation, or movement needed. Serotonin regulates mood, sleep, and appetite. Norepinephrine increases alertness and arousal. Glutamate is the main excitatory neurotransmitter. It's important for learning and memory. GABA is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter, calming neural activity. Acetylcholine enables muscle movement and memory. Endorphins reduce pain and boost pleasure. And finally, substance P carries pain messages to the brain. Hormones are similar to neurotransmitters, except they travel through the bloodstream, so they're slower and longer lasting. Let's go through some. Adrenaline, or epinephrine, triggers fight or flight by increasing heart rate and energy. Leptin signals satiety and reduces appetite. Ghrelin stimulates hunger. Melatonin regulates sleep-wake cycles. And oxytocin promotes bonding, trust, and social connection. Alright, next. When you introduce something like drugs, it muddies up the entire process of a neuron. Some drugs act as agonists, which mimic or boost neurotransmitters, which encourages neural firing. Some act as antagonists, which block receptor sites and therefore discourages firing. And some act as reuptake inhibitors, which block reabsorption of neurotransmitters, leaving more neurotransmitters in the synaptic cleft. Drugs come in four forms. Stimulants like caffeine, nicotine, and cocaine cause increased neural activity. Depressants like alcohol and barbiturates decrease neural activity. Hallucinogens like marijuana and LSD distort perception and cognition. And opioids such as heroin or morphine offer pain relief and a euphoric feeling. And done. Alright, this video covers the brain. This means that there will be a lot of parts to memorize, so I already apologize. We'll start with the brain stem, the most basic structure. It controls automatic survival functions. Within it, the medulla regulates breathing and heart rate. Just above it is the reticular activating system, which is involved in arousal, voluntary movement, and aspects of learning, cognition, and emotion. The cerebellum, or quote, little brain, coordinates muscle movement, balance, and some types of procedural learning. Now here's where things get fun. The cerebral cortex is the outer layer of the brain, divided into two hemispheres. Inside it is the limbic system, which includes the thalamus, which is the relay station for sensory information, the hypothalamus, which regulates hunger, thirst, body temperature, sexual behavior, and it communicates with the pituitary gland to release hormones, the hippocampus, which forms new memories, and the amygdala, which processes emotional things like fear and aggression. The corpus callosum is the thing that connects the two hemispheres, allowing them to communicate. Each hemisphere has four lobes within it. Occipital lobes, located at the back, process vision. Temporal lobes, located on the sides, process auditory information and language. Parietal lobes, near the crown of the head, handle sensory input and contain the somatosensory cortex, which processes touch. And frontal lobes behind the forehead control higher order thinking and executive functioning in the prefrontal cortex and voluntary movement through the motor cortex. Believe it or not, some people with extreme epilepsy have to get their corpus callosum separated. When research was done on these people, it revealed differences between the two hemispheres. We'll only focus on the left hemisphere, which is usually dominant for language. Within it, Broca's area produces speech, while Wernicke's area comprehends it. Damage to either area causes something known as aphasia. The way researchers found this out was actually very interesting, and I urge you to watch the video yourself, link in description. The brain also does something called plasticity, which is the ability to rewire or form new connections so that other areas can sometimes take over functions of a damaged region, especially early in life. Finally, how do we know all of this? How is some idiot named Max Allen who barely got an A- in his high school biology class able to sit here and teach you all of this? The answer is through different research methods. Let's go over them. EEGs measure electrical activity. FMRIs show active brain regions through blood flow. Case studies like Phineas Gage, or better known as the man with a metal rod in his head, highlight how damage changes behavior. And finally, lesioning or surgical procedures have been used to examine specific functions of the brain. Alright, I have officially reviewed the entire brain, for the most part. On the screen now are all of the parts along with the definitions I went over in this video.
Today we're covering sleep. Every night when you decide to sleep, there's a process and reason for it. First, we need to define consciousness. This simply refers to your awareness of thoughts, feelings, behaviors, and what's going on around you. There are two basic states of consciousness, wakefulness and sleep. The sleep-wake cycle is called a circadian rhythm, which is a biological cycle that repeats roughly every 24 hours and some call a biological clock. Things like jet lag or shift work can throw off this rhythm, leading to fatigue, poor performance, and changes in mood. Now let's move into the stages of sleep, which are identified by brain wave patterns measured on an EEG. A full night of sleep typically has about 4-6 to six full 90-minute cycles. A single sleep cycle is broken into stages and repeats throughout the night. Let's go through one 90-minute cycle. Non-REM one is light sleep, where you may experience hypnagogic sensations such as feeling like you're falling. This stage lasts around 5-10 to 10 minutes. Non-REM 2 is deeper and characterized by sleep spindles on an EEG. This stage lasts about 10-25 to 25 minutes. Non-REM 3 is the deepest stage, sometimes called slow wave sleep. As the night progresses, non-REM 3 gets shorter and less frequent, ranging from about 20-40 to 40 minutes. Then you go back to non-REM 2 for a couple of minutes. And finally, REM, or rapid eye movement, is different. It's called paradoxical sleep because the EEG shows brain activity similar to wakefulness, but your body is extremely relaxed and essentially paralyzed. Most dreaming occurs in REM sleep. The amount of REM sleep increases across the night. If you're deprived of REM, your body enters REM rebound, spending extra time in REM the next time you sleep. This sleep cycle lasts a varied amount of time, but will fall within the range of 10 to 60 minutes. After one full cycle is completed, it will simply repeat over and over again until you wake up in the morning. So here is the big question. Why do we even sleep? No one truly knows the answer to this question, but here are a couple of theories. The activation synthesis theory of dreaming suggests dreams are the brain's attempt to make sense of random neural activity. The consolidation theory says dreaming is tied to organization and storing memories. More broadly, sleep itself may help with memory consolidation and restoration of energy and resources used during the day. Next, let's cover sleep disorders, which can seriously affect daily functioning. Insomnia is a disorder where you have difficulty falling or staying asleep. Narcolepsy is a crazy disorder where out of nowhere you will suddenly fall asleep with no warning. Sleep apnea is when there is interrupted breathing during sleep. REM sleep behavior disorder is when you act out dreams because the normal paralysis of REM doesn't occur. And somnambulism is sleepwalking, which usually happens in non-REM stage 3 of sleep. Treatments often include sleep hygiene and consistent schedules to improve waking behavior and overall well-being. Sensation is the process of detecting information from the environment that meets a certain threshold and converting it into neural signals for the brain to process as perception. The absolute threshold is the point where a stimulus can be detected at least 50% of the time. Sensation also involves detecting changes. The just noticeable difference is the minimum change needed to notice a difference. And Weber's law states that this change must be proportional to the original stimulus. Sensory adaptation happens when we become less sensitive to constant, unchanging stimuli. Sensory systems also interact, known as sensory interaction, and sometimes mix in unusual ways, like synesthesia, where one sense is experienced through another. Let's start with vision. The retina is the photosensitive surface at the back of the eye, where light is converted into to neural messages. The blind spot occurs when the optic nerve exits, but the brain fills in the missing information. The lens focuses light through accommodation, and errors here cause nearsightedness or farsightedness. The retina contains two types of photoreceptors, rods, which are in the periphery and detect shapes, movement, and low light, and cones located in the fovea, which detect color and detail. Cones are sensitive to short, medium, and long wavelengths. The trichromatic theory explains color detection through these cones, while the opponent process theory explains after images and color vision through paired processes, such as red-green, blue-yellow, or black-white. Color vision deficiency happens when cones or opponent cells are damaged, such as in dichromatism or monochromatism. Brain damage can also disrupt vision. Prospagnosia is face blindness. And blind sight is the ability to respond to visual stimuli without consciously perceiving them. Next, we move on to hearing. Sound is created by vibrations of air molecules, measured as wavelength for pitch and amplitude for loudness. Theories of pitch include place theory, frequency theory, and volume theory. We also use sound localization to detect where sounds come from. Conduction deafness results from damage to the outer or middle ear, while sensory neural deafness comes from damage to the inner ear or auditory nerve. For the chemical senses, olfaction, or smell, transduces stimuli through receptors in the nose, but unlike other senses, it does not route through the thalamus first. Pheromones are chemical signals that can influence behavior. Gustation, or taste, involves receptors for sweet, sour, salty, bitter umami, and oleogustus. People vary in taste sensitivity as super tasters, medium tasters, 
tasters or non-tasters. Taste and smell interact strongly to create flavor. Now the somatosenses. Touch comes from receptors in the skin that respond to pressure, temperature, and pain. The sensation of hot comes from combined activation of warm and cold receptors. Pain is complex. The gate control theory suggests that pain signals can be blocked and allowed through a spinal gate. Pain limb sensation happens when amputees still feel pain or sensation in a missing limb. Finally, balance and movement. The vestibular sense helps with balance, using the semicircular canals and brain structures to monitor head movement. Kinesthesis is the sense of body movement and position, allowing coordination without constant visual monitoring. On the screen, thank you so much for watching. If it's not too much trouble, why not watch this video and subscribe to this channel? It's my non-educational channel and it's going to have some incredible stuff on it in the future, so I'd really appreciate it if you'd subscribe to it. Thank you!